Good morning, everyone. My name is Pastor Bonnie Howe. Welcome to Worship Online with St. Luke United Methodist Church in Austin, Texas. Friends, would you take a minute and just write a comment in the section below? You can say hello or good morning. We'd love to know that you're with us. It makes us feel more connected together. As students across our nation go back to school in some sort of way, I'm reminded that we are all lifelong learners. We are all continuing to grow in love and faith and compassion. Our own journey may look different compared to our neighbors, and that's okay. It's good, in fact. We each grow in different ways. I've invited a variety of people to share with us a bit of their learning throughout the coming weeks in a series called Hitting the Books. I know that I've personally experienced great times of growth through reading books. When I first was interviewed to be accepted into seminary, I was carrying a book around with me called By the River Piedra I Sat and Wept by Paul Coelho. I was asked, how are you being challenged in your faith? And I pulled out the book. I was wrestling with the feminine divine imagery that was illumined by this fictional book. It ended up being a transformative read for me. So each week, a different person will share of their own transformative experiences through literature. And I know that you will grow through their sharing. We gather together to praise God and to grow together in love and relationship. And so I invite you to join with me in the call to worship this morning. We come into the presence of love together. We come to be transformed. Through the grace of God, our hearts expand. Our minds are renewed. Our relationships are deepened. Our practices of justice are refined. With humility and conviction, we come to discern the will of God. Let the way of Christ be revealed. Let wisdom be our guide. Let us find the quiet center as we enjoy the prelude played by Adam Roberts.
Will you join with me in the opening prayer? Transforming one, through you we come to recognize the everyday ways we turn from love. Practices of evil can be so normal, so ordinary, so common. Though conforming tempts us with its safety and comfort, you urge us toward a more life-giving way. Make us defiers of every mold that confines and constricts the flourishing of life. Amen. Friends, join together and make a joyful noise as we sing our hymn of praise this morning. upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I'm come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to turn to God in prayer, be encouraged to share your prayer requests in the comments. We will pray with you and a time of silence at the end of the prayer and throughout the week. We know that God hears our prayers and cares deeply for you and for us all. We've received prayer requests over the coming weeks and I'd like to lift those up today. We lift up Adam's prayer request for Lauren, a mom who lost her three children in a terrible car accident this week, and her husband is in critical condition. The Gasky family requests that we pray for water and rain as their aquifer is drying out. Adam also asks for a friend who is facing some mental health concerns. Liz asks that we pray for herself, and for her co-workers and the residents of the memory care community and senior living community that she works at. They're experiencing COVID cases. We pray for healing and for strength and hope. And we pray for patience for all of the residents and staff. We pray for Ted, who's a dad of a child here at Slick, who's experiencing some serious health conditions. We also give praise to God for Anne, who had some serious tests this week, some medical tests, and has had really great news from those re results. We also lift up all the university and college students who are returning to campuses or returning class, either online or in person. It's gonna be a really different experience for all students this year, and so we pray for them and for the teachers, their professors. We pray for everyone's health, both physically and emotionally. We also lift up Sandra, who is recovering in hospital in Lubbock after she had a fall and had some a number of broken bones. We also pray for her husband as he cares for her. We also lift up the family of Mary Kay Schultz. Uh, Mary passed away and her family is grieving her loss, so we lift them up, pray for comfort for them. 
Neva has been in a critical car accident and she is recovering and so we pray for her. We also pray for all the teachers and staff um, of SLIC and schools, elementary, middle schools, and high schools in our communities. We lift up our friend Michelle, who is looking for work and is discerning a new path forward. We lift up Bill, who's recovering from surgery, and Gerald, recovering from a stroke. We also lift up Melissa, who was involved in a very serious accident earlier this spring, and for her mom, Annette, who's caring for her. We also lift up all of those people who are frontline workers in our community, who every day go to work, whether it's at the grocery store or community health clinics, testing centers, farm workers, all of those people who continue to work and put themselves and their families at risk from COVID, we pray for all of them. Holy God, we give you thanks with our whole heart, or at least that's the goal, we know that sometimes we hold back our best praise and our best worship, our best selves. God, we're caught up in the fear and the anxiety of the day, but we sing your praise, except when we don't. God, sometimes the news of the day chokes our voice and we stand in silence, unsure of the next note. We come to you this morning in worship, in our homes that have become your temple while we shelter in place. That's what we've decided, but we know deep down that our homes have always been a temple for you. Your steadfast love and faithfulness have always been with us. God, you are above all things, but also you are in all things. Be our encouragement and give us strength. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would be with the leaders of all the nations, that you would give them your spirit of justice and mercy and humility. May they lead in ways that honor you and your creation. Holy God, look upon your children, especially those who are in desperate circumstances, and be glorified as you care for them. We are in the midst of trouble, Lord. Pandemic, economic insecurity, political instability. We are emotionally and mentally worn out. God, stretch out your hand and deliver us. Fulfill your purpose for us. We give you praise, O Lord, for we know without a doubt that your steadfast love endures forever. We know without a doubt that you hear us when we pray. And so God, we lift up our prayers to you. Praise be to you, O oh God. Amen. Friends, let us sing together our hymn of prayer. Blessed be your name in a land that is plentiful, streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, while through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. And when the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious 
Jesus' name. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me. The world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering. When there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. And every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. And when the darkness closes in, Lord, Still I will say Blessed be the name of the Lord Blessed be your name Blessed be the name of the Lord Blessed be your glorious name Blessed be the name of the Lord Blessed be your name Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Oh, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. And when the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. The body of Christ is made of many members. We each come with our own offerings. We bring our stories, our talents, our resources, and all that make us who we are in God. We bring it in service to love and liberation. We each play a vital part in the movement of the Lord. And in this time of pandemic, it is imperative that we do what we can to foster community within both the church community and our respective neighborhoods. Part of our mission as Christians is to love our neighbors. Back in the spring, which seems like a lifetime ago, we were running errands for our neighbors and hosting driveway gatherings and sharing sidewalk chalk messages of love. But with 100 plus degree weather, we've retreated into our air conditioned homes. We started binge watching the news and Netflix, and it feels like we've become more isolated than ever before. Our dear sister Gabriella remarked to me one day that we are physically distant, but we need to remember that we are not socially distant. We are connected to one another. So the challenge for us all this week I have a challenge for you, it's kind of like homework, is to make two phone calls. I'd like each of us to call one person from our faith family, someone that we haven't seen or spoken to in a while. Pray about it, and God will bring a person to your heart and mind. And then I'd like you to call a neighbor, an actual neighbor. If you don't have their number, write a card and slip it into their mailbox. Ask, how are you doing? and be really interested to know. It might feel like effort, because it is. <laughs> Neighborliness takes effort, but I'm confident that you will be blessed as you bless others. Friends, we appreciate your support for all the efforts of St. Luke. We're still working to bring about God's peace, hope, love, and justice in the world. Thank you for your gifts, your offerings, your generosity. As you continue to give through our website at stlukeaustin.com or when you mail in a check to St. Luke at 1306 West Lynn Street in Austin, Texas, 78703, it is going to God's work. Friends, let us pray. 
Spirit of life, you accept us just as we are, even as you lure us more deeply into love. You bring us into the company of others to expand our understanding. You send us prophets. You call us to courage. You companion us through wisdom, ancient and new. For all the ways your grace enables us to grow, we bring our offerings with gratitude and renew our commitment to pursuing what is good and true and just. Amen. worshiping with you, would you let them know that this is a special time for them? Good morning, everybody. It's good to be together with you this morning. But it's been a strange week, hasn't it? Or maybe it's just been the same as last week and the week before and the week before. But this was the week that you were originally supposed to start school, wasn't it? But now something's come up. This virus, this pandemic, and everything has had to wait. School has been put on hold. You know, when things come up and change our plans, sometimes it makes us confused or upset. I know when I was little, I would have hated to have to wait to go back to school because I loved school. But I think of Jesus and how so many times his plans had to change. I remember one day he heard some bad news about a friend, John the Baptist, and he decided he needed to have some time alone. He made plans to go away by himself. But people kept following him. They'd seen him heal people, or at least they'd heard of it, and they were curious about his teachings and wanted to hear more. Now remember, Jesus had planned to have some time to himself, but when he saw all the people, saw their need, his plans changed. He couldn't ignore them. Instead, he had compassion on them and he chose to help them. Plans change and it's okay. Sometimes the interruption leads to something even better. Jesus was able to heal people and feed them. He showed them great love. And then he was able to go away and find some time to himself. School will start sometime, but in the meantime, maybe God is bringing a change of plans to you for a reason. So friends, I invite you to keep your eyes open and keep your heart open because God's plans are always good. And maybe God's gonna bring something good to your heart, to your eyes. He has a good plan for you. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your plans. Help us to be okay with how our plans have changed. Help us to see what you are doing in the world so that we can be a part of it too. We love you, God. Amen. Amen. Will you join me in the prayer for illumination? Spirit of glory, Spirit of God, bless us with a word of life this day to restore support, strengthen, and transform us as we seek to be one with you. Amen. Friends, our message today comes from an incredible young person, Rowan Craig. Rowan is a student at UT Austin and is active in the Texas Wesley. St. Luke claims them as our own during the school year. We're so pleased that Rowan was willing to share their insights with us today. Praise be to God for their message. Hi, I'm Rowan Craig. I am a junior biology major at the University of Texas. I am also a student with the Texas Wesley Foundation, and I am very excited to be participating in the Hitting the Books sermon series. 
And the reason I chose to participate in this series and talk about the Percy Jackson books is because they shaped a large part of my childhood, and it's definitely not a stretch that they shaped my faith as well. Because of Percy Jackson, I learned quite a bit about acceptance, identifying God's presence in my life, and identifying the way that he works through communities. And so first, talking about acceptance, um, you see this a lot in the characterization of Percy. Uh, Percy is a very so-called troubled kid. Um, he has ADHD and dyslexia, and he's been told his whole life that he can never do anything right. He's been kicked out of six boarding schools in six years because he was accident prone, read, attacked by monsters all the time because he's a demigod. Um, he also has to deal with his stepdad, which he affectionately names Smelly Gabe, who is really, really mean and abusive to his mother. And he also just doesn't have very many friends where he is, so he lives a very troubled, difficult life. But he finds out that he's a demigod, and then he gets to go to Camp Half-Blood, and it's the first place that he's ever felt accepted, and he learns that all the things that he's been struggling with, the learning disabilities, the monster attacks, they're a result of these incredible gifts that he has as a demigod. Uh, a quote from the book says, after he finished his first quest, Percy says, I'd finally found a family, people who cared about me, and thought I'd done something right. And so, through his time at Camp Half-Blood, he learned that the ADHD that he struggles with so much is what helps him be so successful in combat, and the, the fact that he was dyslexic um, meant that he was actually more wired to read in ancient Greek than in English, and so once he figured that out, he was able to read just fine. And he also learned that all the freak accidents that happened to him that were often related to water were actually a demonstration of his powers and not his fault at all. And like Percy, I myself have been told that many of the things that make me different from people and a lot of the struggles that I go through are flawed aspects of me that don't match up to the image of the way that God that made me. Um, like, I am a member of the LGBT community, and I've struggled for years with my mental health, and I am also not afraid to call out people when they speak in problematic ways or behave problematically. And that's not the way that I was taught to behave, but all of these so-called flaws that I have have actually made me better able to empathize and advocate for other people. And I found that's one of my spiritual gifts, the more that I've learned to use it and accept it. And I have Percy to thank for that. Um, the second thing that I learned from this series is seeing God's presence in subtle ways. Now, the gods in the Percy Jackson universe are notorious for just being distant and ignoring their children. Um, you can see this a lot in the Hermes cabinet camp where all of the unclaimed demigods go, which meant that their parents never said, yes, this is my kid. Um, and also you see it in like the really cryptic way the gods themselves choose to interact with the heroes in the stories. Um, a good example of this is in the second book of the series, after Percy finishes a quest and he like finally gets to like see his dad and stuff and he like, feels like his father is proud of him, he gets a note that just says, brace yourself, because his dad knows what's coming, but he doesn't, and that's all the context that he gets. Um, the gods also help very minimally with quests, and the help that they do lend is often only seen in hindsight. And though our god is definitely much nicer to us than the gods in the Percy Jackson universe, it's the way that he works is not all that dissimilar from the way that God works in our lives because we don't always see it in the most direct ways. Uh, Philippians 2, 12 through 13 says, Therefore, my friends, as you have obeyed not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and act in order to fulfill his good purpose. And so, for me, seeing God through an answered prayer, or a worship song, or the end of the stressful week, or even a good interaction I've had with a stranger, happens much more frequently than what we'd like to call the burning bush moments of the Old Testament. 
And so by reading the Percy Jackson series as a child and rereading and like looking for foreshadowing and all the ways that the gods were working in subtle ways in Percy's life gave me some really good practice for identifying the ways that my God was doing the same in my life. And the last and one of the most important things I learned from Percy's narrative is seeing God's presence and how he works through a community. Now, Camp Half-Blood is a safe haven for demigods. Uh, most of the time in the series, uh, if they try to live on their own, they live very short lives, uh, very dangerous lives. But at Camp Halfwood, uh, it's a place that they can call home and a place that they can be safe. And it is also a diverse community in which the demigods themselves have varying skills according to who their godly parent is. And so because of these various skills, they will work together on quests and camp activities, and they'll use their different skills to their advantage to win. And so even the so-called weaker cabins at camp um, have their purpose within the community. So for example, um, the goddess Demeter of grain is seen as a very weak cabin, but those are the kids that tend the strawberry fields at camp that make Camp Half-Blood the money to keep running as a summer camp. And so in this same way, uh, Christian communities have learned to utilize the varied skills of our members. And so members might have very different skills such as public speaking or music or emotional intelligence or technological skills. And they're all necessary in church environments and they're all provided by different people most of the time. And now, this is really when 1 Corinthians 12 uh, kicks in the most extensively, and when I was researching all of this, um, it talks extensively about the full body of Christ and how it utilizes the different talents of its members, and how it works together without discounting any one part of the body. Uh, my favorite part of this whole passage is verses 21 to 23, and it says, The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you, and the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and the parts that we think are less honorable we treat with special honor, and the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. And this to me just speaks volumes about the ways that we should be using people's gifts in communities and also just the ways that we've been doing it wrong. Um, at, at Camp Half-Fled, they obviously learned to utilize everyone's abilities, and we as a church must do the same, but it's not an uncommon thing for someone to be looked down upon because their spiritual gift is like not seen as quote-unquote as cool or acceptable or as useful as someone else's. And because of Percy Jackson, I was able to really like look out for that a lot more carefully because I got some pretty good practice identifying the strengths of quote unquote weaker characters. And so whenever I see that happening in the churches that I attend now, I'm able to call it out. And also, lastly for me, um, community comes with acceptance and support. And the same is true for Percy and all the demigods of Camp half uh, They're able to survive, period, because they come together and train in this safe haven. And in the same way, I am able to survive and thrive because I am accepted and supported by my community at the Texas Wesley and the community here at St. Luke. Uh, the Wesley has been here for me through almost every hardship that I've had in my life. They were here to support me emotionally and pray for me as I navigated my gender identity. Uh, they reminded me of my strengths when I discounted them myself. And because of the Wesley community, any work that I do for God, I know that I don't have to do it alone. And so all in all, the part of Percy's narrative that impacted me the most profoundly was the reminder that the things that make you different are the things that actually make you strong, and that God created me with a specific purpose and skill set, and he surrounded me with a community that accepts me and will work with me to enact God's will.
And I think that that is pretty cool. Thank you, Rowan. Friends, let us join together in our hymn of response. The words will be on your screen. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of Thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for Thee. Take my voice and let me sing Always only for my King Take my lips and let them be Filled with messages from Thee Take my silver and my gold Not a mite would I withhold Take my intellect and use every power as you choose. Here am I. stlukeaustin.com. Thanks so much.
Friends, hear this blessing. Faithful ones, the aches of the world, the struggles of our neighbors, the grief that fills our hearts, they call us to listen for God's guiding wisdom. We listen that we might be transformed and bring about transformation. For the sake of the flourishing of collective life, the Spirit sends us to learn from one another, to grow in the ways of liberation, and to love as the body of Christ. Friends, as we close today, we'll sing our Irish blessing. I pray you go in peace. Amen. May the road rise up to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm on your face. And the 